Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Courageous Leadership Academy Live. I'm your host, Dr. Kelly Waltman, and if you're new to this series, we talk about all things leadership, and that's from uh, actual leadership, communication, conversations, business ownership, how to be more successful um, as an entrepreneur, business owner, really just helping you be uh, a better leader and uh, person. And our guest today is uh, perfect for this type of conversation. Our guest today is Dr. Tracy Jones. She's an author, speaker, Air Force Academy graduate, decorated veteran, international leadership expert, scholar, and researcher. And on top of all that, she is the president of Tremendous Leadership. She's the author of several books, including Beyond Tremendous, Raising the Bar on Life, and A Message to Millennials, Encouraging the Next Generation of Leaders by Teaching the Importance of Followership. So those are two great books I recommend you check out. And her latest book, Spark, uh, the subtitle is Five Essentials to Igniting the Greatness Within. What a fantastic title. And I'm really excited to talk to her about this topic. And with all the research she's done and the writing and her lifelong pursuit of learning, Dr. Jones is always looking for opportunities to help businesses invest in their employees. And again, she's going to help us with that today. So without further ado, let's bring Dr. Tracy Jones into the session. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, I'm thrilled that you're here and you're sharing your time with us today. Really, really appreciate it. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share in terms of an introduction before we dive into our conversation? No, that was tremendous. I'm like, wow, this is a great, great introduction. Thank you so much for the honor of that. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Thank you for um, doing such amazing work and uh, giving us lots to lots to talk about. Um, it's, it's, you've been very, very busy. Um, so you know, our theme for today, our title is the myth of leadership. And, and I love that as a, as a title because it's just like, okay, what the heck are we going to say for the myth of leadership? So what does that mean to you? And when, when, when you say that, that phrase, what, what does that mean to you? Well, this started um, back as a young leader. Uh, when I was 14 years old, I got my first, they call it uh, your work release, which sounds like I was in jail as a child. But I, but back in the day, you would get work release papers because if you were under 16, you had to get your parents' authorization. So I started working at a very young age and have not stopped since, okay, and do not intend to ever stop. Uh, so what I really did was uh, I grew up with a father who was very passionate about leadership. So um, it w I tell people it was kind of like a cross between boot camp and a sitcom, okay? <laughs> it was always a lot of fun because he was motivational, but as a leader, it was always very driven and goal-oriented. Everything had to have a purpose or a lesson, you know, everything. And so I grew up really learning that leadership is a privilege, and we all are put on this earth to lead at something, even if it's just leading yourself. And I was exposed to really unbelievable people uh, from an early age on talking about uh, leadership. And they really taught me a very pragmatic approach to leadership, that it is what we are called to do, that it is an unbelievable service that we provide to others, but it is one of the most daunting, debilitating, horrible things you're ever going to do. So I always had this very, look, it's great but it's gonna kick you and kick you hard. And I think that's where I, I was never shocked then when I got into different leadership roles. So did a lot of different things. You heard my background, always trying to hone my leadership chops, grow my experiential bag and really work with people and see, hey, what worked good, what, what did not. So about five and a half years ago, I entered my doctoral program on leadership, imagine that. Mm -hmm. And I remember studying it and all the theory, which is all grounded research. Okay. So it's, it's based in actual research, but I remember I would always hear people say things like, well, if the people just aren't doing well, that's on you. And I'm like, mm, okay, so I've worked for 20 years with people and I can really do better as a leader, but I'm not thinking it's all on me. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? That's like a parent saying, I'm completely responsible for the failings of my adult child. I mean, or a husband saying it's all on my wife. Now, everybody in any kind of dyadic relationship, there's ownership on both parts. So I got really burnt out, Kelly, halfway through my studies. And I'm like, I, I can't take this anymore. 
I am so tired of everybody crapping on the leader and saying it's the leader and it's the leader. And, and if you didn't do this, you didn't do that. And I'm like, there's got to be more to it than this. So I stumbled across a book by Robert Kelly called The Power of Followership. And it really reversed the lens on leadership to followership. And what it really taught me was, if you want a better leader, be a better follower. How obvious is that? If you want a better husband, be a better wife. If you want a better kid, be a better, you know what I'm saying? So it was so obvious, but for whatever reason, when we get into a professional setting, we treat employees like they're babies. And we have to guess what they want and we have to coddle them and we have to put up with temper tantrums and stuff. And it's getting more and more pronounced. And so I'm just like, no, this has not been my experience of living all over the world and working in all different settings and cultures. And so I really did my uh, doctoral research on um, a crisis event. And I did a case study interview of people to find out what was it in the leader that caused you to stand with them or that you ran away and flipped out. And I found out it really had nothing to do with what the leader said or did. Where it was rooted was in the individual's regenerative nature, their adaptive capacity, and their resilience. Mm -hmm. And so what I read, sure, as a leader, we then create the enabling construct. Absolutely. Okay. But I still maintain you can be the work for the worst leader in the world and still have brilliant employees. You won't have them for long, but brilliant employees know how to self-motivate and drive themselves. So then I, I realized there really is no such thing as leadership. There is only individual motivation. And what we as leaders need to do to engage in leadership, we have to find those people that have a desire to be led and developed. I tell people, if followership is beneath you, leadership is way beyond you. Okay. But that's not taught anymore because everybody gets surprised. Everybody is great. And it's like, but everybody is not great. And we talk about bringing out the best in people. Well, what if you're not bringing the best to me in the work environment? And I hate to be mean, um, but I'm going to be truthful because I love people. Anybody listening out there knows that they have been in work situations where there have been people that have been an absolute nightmare to work with. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me that everybody's great and they just show up waiting for you to let them be great. That's, that's an absolute myth. So what I really work on is dialing in what kind of follower the leader's looking for. Mm -hmm. And for followers, dialing in what kind of leader brings out the best in you. And that's going to be as varied and different as our personalities are. And mm -hmm. it's when, you know, culture is one thing, but I never left a job because of a culture. I left a job because of a boss, because I either lost respect for them or, um, you know, they, they were triggering the untremendous side of me. So that's really what I work with as far as leadership, the, the leadership followership paradigm. And that's why I say, you know, if you, when you bring people on your team, you cannot motivate them. The only form of motivation that works or lasts is self-motivation. You can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make him drink. But as leaders, we try and put salt in their oats. But do you know there are many organizational horses out there that are actually horses patooties that just refuse to drink? You know it. And if you haven't seen it, you're asleep at the wheel, especially as right. a leader. Um, right. You know, it's just the way it is. So um, yeah. you know, that's really what I work on as far as the myth of leadership. And once I realized this, I was able to really go, now listen, I am still honing my chops as a leader. I am still uncovering my own biases, assumptions, and blind spots. I'm working to be a better leader. But I'm a lot more clear on what I'm looking for in a teammate or a co-leader and I'm looking for, it's like a professional dating matchmaking service. You don't want to date somebody that has a value congruence completely different than yours. And don't bring them into your organization and say, well, I'll, I'll train them. No, you won't, because that's an intrinsic part of who they are. Resiliency is something you got or you don't got. And you need to find your resilient people because talk about courageous leadership. They are going to be the courageous ones. So that's a long, that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. There was like, so as I'm, as you're talking, I'm listening and there's so many things I could unpack. Um, yeah, that was the word unpack. I love unpack, that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I love that you say, because it's so true. You're right. And is there a responsibility on leaders to, um, clearly relay expectations? Absolutely. And if Absolutely. you're not doing that, that's on you. And, and is it, 
on you to hold people accountable, absolutely. To provide that positive and critical feedback, absolutely. But to say that, yes, all of the onus is on the leader and, and that the employee doesn't have any responsibility is completely misguided. And I, and I agree that there is, you know, people are their own beings, their own entities, and you can work with them, you can coach them, and you should do those things, but it is up to that individual. And you're you're right, there are times that people are just really difficult. <laughs> oh, I think you froze up on me, Tracy. Hopefully we get you back here in a second. But, you know, as we wait for Tracy to, to come back, she's a little frozen. Um, you know, I, I think that it's such a great point to think about how, again, we need to respect people's self-motivation. We should work with their self-motivation, um, but we can't force people to do things. Like you said, we can't, we can lead a horse to water, but we can't force them to drink. Um, you know, we need to, to, to make sure that there is that value congruency. I love that, that Tracy shared that. Um, it looks like we lost her. Hopefully she comes back soon. Um, if you have any questions, uh, this is a great time. If you have any questions or comments, I see some coming in on the chat. Um, people are loving the insight and they live by that. Being a great follower is essential in leadership. Yeah, I love that that quote from Tracy that um, if followership is beneath you, then leadership is definitely beyond you. That is so true. Um, that's a that's a key piece. Um, and again, some more people just giving some some reaffirming information here. Um, and hopefully we can get Tracy back into the broadcast. I apologize, everyone. Oh, here she is. Yeah. Back. Well, technical difficulty. <laughs> One of my cats or dogs unplugged the hardwire. I'm oh so my goodness. <laughs> They're not good followers. We're gonna have a little a little talk. My apologies. Oh my goodness. That's okay. So I was just ad libbing <laughs> a little bit, recapping some of what you shared and, and some of the comments. Um, you know, people are just saying that they're they're loving the insight. Um and they appreciate it that it's it's very on point. So Oh, it's all good. Yeah. Thank you. Well, one of the things that you were talking about um, before my somebody so really interrupted me, um, you were talking about, you know, what here's the leader's requirement. But remember, like you said, there's a flip side to it. And I think it was Zig Ziglar had a great quote and he said, we are responsible to people, but not mm -hmm. for people. OK, I as a leader, I'm responsible to give you expectation, the resources you need and, you know, whatever else requires. But I'm not responsible for you. And we're, my fear is that over the years we have really morphed into almost a babyish work environment right. and we're allowing a lot of things to go on because, well, this is just the way it is now. Mm, no, it's not. No, it's not. And uh, so, you know, that, that's one of the things. And, and what you said, too, the beauty of exemplary followership, according to Robert Kelly, is two things. Number one, there are wonderful critical thinkers. OK, not critical spirit. OK, people are like, well, yeah, I tell my boss they're wrong. All that. I'd like that is a critical spirit. OK, critical thinking means if your boss has not set expectations, talk to them. Right. Leaders aren't mind readers. We don't know what is ailing you. So you have a responsibility. It's just like sitting there and, and, and seeing if your husband can guess what irritated you today. Right. You may not talk for a week and a half. This is ridiculous. Talk to your boss, be open with them, give them feedback. The other um, construct is as far as uh, critical thinking, all in engagement. Okay. You know, leaders are so busy. I can't be your cheerleader. Get in the game or let's move on to something else, a game that get on another bus that you like better. And so those are the two things that really I tell followers. If you if you don't see value in the mission, um, find another mission. And if you don't have a reasonable expectation of success at doing your job, tell your leader exactly what you need to be successful and they will do it for you. And if they don't, then it's time to find another leader. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. So in thinking about, um, <laughs> you know, being, um, you know, a, a quality leader, um, you know, what does tremendous leadership t mean to you? That's, I know, um, that's a big word. And that's a, a, a big word for a good reason that that um, you use quite a bit. So what does what does tremendous leadership mean to you? 
Well, thank you, Kelly. Tremendous leadership means to me courage, humility, um, regenerative nature. Tremendous leadership is really all about creating an atmosphere that will unlock what is already inside of you. Mm. And so what we really strive to do is a lot of people try and mold you to be something different. Our approach is you already have this innate great already imprinted on you. Okay. That's, that's a fact. All right. Now, whether you choose to see it or not, we try and get your head in the game and to see where you're at right now and where you can be. And it's not just, um, it's not just all about you. The world needs the greatest version of you. So we really help people get in their heads in the game to realize, hey, what you've been through, there's only one of you. And you have this um, zone of gifting that nobody else has. And it kind of harkens back to the, the Jim Collins good to great hedgehog principle. What are you the best in the world at? And people will say to me, well, nothing. Oh, yes, there is. There's, your experience becomes your expertise. There is something you have been through in your context that only you have been through. Number two, what are you passionate about? And that's we go back to like our childhood when we were nine and what the leadership experts say, that's when you're most often likely to learn new languages and be in touch with what you really want to be when you grow up. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, uh, what can you do to drive your economic engine? What, what can you do that people will pay you for? Because if you're really in that, that greatness, that zone of gifting, you are going to provide a solution or a feeling to people and they are going to resonate with you and they, they are going to gravitate to you. And that's why it's so important for leadership and tremendous leadership. Leaders know what does it for you. There's a, a research theory called implicit uh, followership theory. I have to know, you have to know as a leader, you have to know as a parent, as a friend, as a whatever, what brings out the best in you. And then you'd be, you'd be very intentional about bringing that into you. And you also be very intentional about pruning out anything else that doesn't make the cut. So good in, but you've got to also, also get rid of the bad. And then implicit leadership theory is for anybody out there, because we all work for somebody, even I who run my own company, everybody has people that they have to answer to. Um, understand, uh, for me, it's who is my ideal market? Who's my ideal client? Who's my avatar? I don't want to just speak to anybody. I don't want to publish just anybody's book. I got to know who really hits and gets our value. There's a strong congruence. And so when you do this, work becomes a joy, a synergy, a synchronicity, a reciprocity versus it's Sunday night. I feel sick. I can't sleep. Oh my gosh, it's Friday afternoon. Let's go drink because <laughs> it shouldn't be that way. And if it is that way, something's wrong. And it's time to either make a change or just keep doing the same thing. Right. Which is not a great choice. <laughs> not a great choice, but it takes courage it's, it's, it's courage yeah and, and it takes soul searching it takes self-awareness um and for our listeners out there tremendous leadership is all about helping you see the incredible value in you you may not see it you may think oh my gosh i could never get another job i could never i'm too old wrong wrong you're just getting started and at any time you can pivot with purpose and start the next chapter of your life i mean we're all living to be like 90 and 100 um, I'm, I'm barely on the back nine of life. I'm just getting started. And right. I just started figuring it out too. So. Right, right. I know as I joke around people, like I said, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> that's a beautiful space to be because it means you're right. open and, yeah. and you're willing to just keep evolving and growing. And that's the meaning of life. Yeah. Yeah. When you were just speaking there about change, it reminds me um, in the book, you had this one, section where you're talking about change well it's a lot in the book but um there was a a, a line about um you need to exchange like to change and i don't know you didn't write it exactly that way but that was the note i wrote to myself because i'd never thought about it that way you know you need to exchange your prior circumstance or your prior feeling or your prior whatever you need to exchange that to change and um and you talk about also that all change is death you know you need to some part of you or your life or your circumstance needs to die so that this new part can come into being. And I just thought that was really powerful. And and you're right, it's, it is scary for a lot of people. It is um, because of those things, uh, those those reasons. It's it's not easy to 
to let go. Um, and, and it does take courage, but I, I love the way you, you phrased that in the book. That was a really, it just really resonated with me a lot. I appreciated that. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And when you, you know, everybody keeps talking about your comfort zone, why people are reluctant to leave their comfort zone, because they know comfort zones are a quagmire, is because they haven't identified their strength zone. When you identify, and that's what in SPARK is an acronym, singularity. When you dial in your strength, you have a hard time sleeping because now you know what your purpose is. And when we find our purpose, we can deal with anything. And you talking about that exchange, I'm going to use a real world example. I, I, as we talked earlier, and those of you that know me, I have a pup that for the past six weeks, we have been dealing with um, something really unknown and scary. And we have taken him to four specialists, four ERs, four different doctor appointments. We got one at three this afternoon. We have been on antibiotics, antifungal, prednisone, myloquin, revolution, ear, you name it. And still no relief. So here I am, and I'm putting all the good on this dog that typically, and he's eating steak, he's eating salmon, we're going raw. I mean, he's eating eggs, he's eating, he's eating better than my husband. He's like, is that my <laughs> shoulder? I'm like, no, that's for Roscoe. I mean, this dog, this is it. But still, something is wrong. Right. And so I'm like, as a researcher, I'm, so I'm up all night, like, what, what is it? What, there must be something else. And any of you that have dealt with particularly dermatological issues or autoimmune, you just keep looking, 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 and you never really know what triggered it, but you've got to figure it out. And then you have to find out what you need to do. Finally, at the last minute, I'm like, well, you know what? He still get, there's still something wrong. There's, how can there still be something wrong? And I'm waiting for the skin biopsies to come on back. And so then I go and I say, well, I'm going to try one other thing. I'm going to give him a sulfur bath. So I gave him a sulfur, a sulfur dip, okay? And for those of you that have rescued cats and kittens or have cattle, sulfur dip. So anybody out there with dog issues, highly recommend this. So I get in there and I'll be darned, he has had skin scraping, he has been, he's on revolution, there is no way any little bugger could have been living on him and yet something came out of him. Little tiny fur mites, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I, none of my dogs have them, I wash his bedding every day. How, how is this? But the, the, the point of it is when you said that, I could have done the greatest things in the world for him, but until you eradicate the bad, and Ruby Ren wrote a book called Saucy Aussie Living and she, getting a second leash on life. And her quote was always, let a single flea stay on me and soon you'll be in misery. Okay, <laughs> so that's what that reminded me, that's how wisdom right there. That's what that reminded me of, no matter how much good I did until I eradicated and got to the root source. And maybe it's a fear. And maybe it's a negative person. And maybe it's this bullcrap story you keep, this this lie, this this perceived, uh, you know, either real or perceived thing that happened to you. Let it go. Get flea free. And now that was two days ago. I can already see. Now, we got a long way to go in the, in the, surge, in the recovery process. But I think I actually eradicate it. Now, I will have to keep eradicating that. And that's the thing. Um, about getting out the negative people, the toxic people, the negative self-talk, the stinking thinking. Zig Ziglar has another one of my favorite quotes, and he says, they say positive thinking doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. So every day, you got to cut the crap. I mean, your mind is a vacuum. And even if you hear this stuff in the background, that's why I tell people, turn that crap off. Or if so, I, I'm in a restaurant, listen to incredibly toxic, disgusting converse, I'll move someplace else because your mind, stuff just comes into your mind, guard it because whatever is in there, if you don't eradicate it right away, just like those little mites that he probably got digging in the soil, you got an infestation. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I, I love that you say that because it does require that intentionality and that vigilance. I think it's, sometimes it's so easy to just become passive consumers to so much not negativity that we don't even realize is, is it's coming at us from all these different angles from, you know, whether it's television or conversations or whatever, um, what we see online. And, um, you know, yes, of course, we can't completely avoid bumping into it, but we can be intentional then about redirecting ourselves and really just being aware of how powerful that is, the messaging that we that we take in both consciously and, and subconsciously. So I love that that you share that because it 
Yeah, it's it's so true, and it really yeah. does make a difference. Well, yeah. it does in critical thinking skills. I tell people, yeah. you know, I learned a lot from my PhD, uh, and I got a book out of it too. Um, but the greatest thing I learned was how to critically think. Remember, I talked about critical thinking, and so I tell people, if you can't cite it, don't write it or speak it. Yes. If you can't go back and show me the grounded research where you got that, and that's why I live at peace. And I, I recommend to people all this stuff you're reading about. Do you know that's completely fiction or editorialization or whatever or a narrative? Are you really going to live in a fear space based on a lie? It's like um, what was that Blair Witch Project? Or what was the one where they were living in the woods and they were scared all the time? It's like Blair Witch Project. It's like it's the woods. Yeah. I mean, come on, guys. You know, unpack it. I grew up in the woods, so I can remember watching that movie thinking, "Are people really scared of the woods? I don't understand this." And people are like, "Oh, it's so weird, so horrifying." I'm like, "Whatever," you know. Okay, maybe you should get out in the woods and see and see the woods kind of thing. Um, right. But I would really say um, if something is vexing you or stressing you, unpack it. Get yeah. out there, unpack it. And when you shine the light of fact and people are like, well, I can't find facts. Yeah, you can. You just got to be really diligent. Um, there's certain websites, even for COVID, there's certain uh, right. med page and New England Medical Journal where I go on to where I really get to listen to doctors talking about real issues. And so then I get to really make informed choices about, mm, 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 okay, okay. And um, I don't have to live in the, um, but it takes intentionality. Don't be a lazy thinker. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's a great quote. Don't be a lazy thinker. I love it. <laughs> lazy brains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So in thinking, you know, we've talked a little bit about, about your book, Spark, um, and I'll make sure I have a link to it in the in the show notes where people can find it. Um, but uh, let's talk about the five components, because that's your, your subtitle is Five Essentials to Ignite the Greatness Within. So you mentioned the first one, the S, because um, Spark is, a, is an acronym, singularity. Do you want to just talk a little bit more about, about that as a concept and then walk us through the, the other components? Absolutely. Well, I am, uh, like you said, an engineer by trade. So although you can tell me conceptually what's going on, I am the type of learner that if you don't give me a construct or the tools to do it, I'm just like, how are we supposed to get this done? And right. I can figure it out, but I need the means to get it done. So I am a big believer in construct because like you, trying to grow a business, trying to determine what to go next, there's some things I'm doing right, but there were some things where I'm like, I, it's still not firing. Why am I not getting traction? And I knew I knew it, I, I, I shouldn't just like start from square one. I needed to really identify. And I was in quality assurance on fighter jets as uh, there they are in the back. There they are in the back as a maintenance officer. So, so when the jet would come down non-mission capable, you don't just swap out everything or trash it. You go through and you troubleshoot and you figure out uh, this is this is what it is, and these are the parts. This is the te this is the testing. This is what I need to do to get it back to fully mission capable. So I came up with the construct of five keys, and there's an intrinsic component to it and an external component to it. And I think where a lot of personal development fails is they start with just getting you all fired up and you're ready to declare the world. This is what I'm doing, and then you go out there and tell the world, and the world's like you're an idiot or shut up or whatever. And, I'm, and, and then you, oh, you know, and so I'm like, okay, so we got the intrinsic thing going. Okay. Now we have to talk about what are the externals you need. So just like leadership and followership, two sides of the same coin. Okay. You can't put it all on the boss because you as the employee, there's more of you than them. You have a bigger responsibility for creating success in the organization. Remember that, okay? So, uh, and really, followership is about eighty percent of the success in an organization because you know, unless the the, the leader's doing something illegal, immoral, immoral, or unethical, that now get found out. Um, you know, followership really is responsible for the success or failure of any any enterprise. Although we like to blame leaders, but let's we're all in this together. We're all drawing a paycheck, so we should all show up. So, Spark is really singularity, persistence. A is for advocates, R is for resources, and K is for knowledge. So the first two, S and P, are singularity and persistence. This is what you bring to the table. People will say to me, should I write this book? Should I marry this person? Should I go back? I, I don't know. I'm not you. Only God knows your heart. 
you have, now I can help you. There's many tests and many constructs out there. And this is why life coaches are wonderful to help you really dial in what is the best use of time. I tell people, if you had a microphone to the world for 30 minutes, what would your message be? That's your singularity. That's what you're most passionate about. You know, that's what you're put on this world to do. So that's not enough. Persistence. I can't do the work for you. Okay. You know, they say some people are like blisters. They show up after the work is done. You know, so I can't work for you. And a lot of people sit back. Well, the taxpayer is just paying me to do nothing. Friend, that is dangerous. Okay. You cannot outsource work. So you have to know your anointing. And when you do, then you become relentless. Okay, so once you dial these in and singularity is the most important one, because when you dial that in, everything seems to follow because you don't care about people saying you're an idiot. You're like, too bad. So sad. <laughs> you know, I know what I'm here to do. And then you really become almost relentless. You don't mm -hmm. mind the nose. You don't mind the setbacks. You, you become very all in and tenacious. So that's the first two. But we are not coded either from a theological standpoint or an evolutionary standpoint to go through life on our own. We are meant to be in a collective and you can't get it right without the right people, processes and products. Uh, that's why the law of attraction was always so people would be like, this is ridiculous. I can't just wish um, a, a red Porsche to be in my driveway. OK, well, I can, but it's not going to happen. You, there's certain things that must be done. So A is for advocates. These are the people that want your success more than even you want it. These are your earth angels. These are your benefactors, your prefects. These are the connectors. And you say, I don't have any. I'm like, yeah, you do. You just haven't made yourself open to them. You have to ask them what you want specifically, and you have to authorize them to act on your behalf. That's mm -hmm. the big People don't realize, oh my gosh, you know, um, and people are like, well, Tracy, you have all these connections. And I'm like, yeah, because I cultivate them and I ask them. So this is your networking. OK, R is your resources. These are your website, your contractors, your marketers, your logistics. These are your brand people. These are people that you actually exchange money with your employees. So they give you the means to get it done, because without people actually doing the technical aspect of it, nothing gets executed. So that's R for resources. And then K is knowledge, okay? Because what you know now is not gonna be enough to get you through next week or next month. So you have to be constantly in the state of open to learning, researching, unlearning, relearning, right? Because you can't just keep growing up. You gotta go, oh. And again, Zig Ziglar said that's, um, we don't change people's mind. We just add new information and then they actually come to a different final conclusion. You know, that's why this argument on social media is so idiotic. Stop. What? I know. I tell them, I'm like, no, it's fine. you're not going to change anybody's mind. You're not by adding to the comments. Right. They right. couldn't even change their mind. Right. They, they're, they're, there is research. Like, like I, I look at people, I have known uh, dear people that have an addiction problem. Hey, if you don't stop, you're going to die. Guess what? They don't stop. I'm not going to change their mind. Okay. Right. Because right. unless you get, you know, uh, unless you get that pleasure or pain point there, nothing, no behavior is going to change. So that's really what Spark is. And it's, it's a meta cycle. You constantly do it. But in the book, I really help you dial in. Which of those are you missing? So here I am 12 years back and I realized, okay, I need to keep honing my singularity, which I think singularity needs honed all the time. Uh, persistence, not a problem. I'll die before I quit. I mean, I'm just, I'm, ten <laughs> I'm not quitting. And my dad told me that you can want to quit. Just don't quit. You know, right. you make a decision, make it yours and die by it. I mean, I was, I went to war twice. I'm not, I'm not quitting. I don't care. I'm not quitting. Um, I'll pivot, but I'm not quitting. And um, so then I'm like advocates. I have so many unbelievable advocates. Many of the people listening are just huge advocates for us and knowledge. I just got my THC, but I'm like, I am really resource constrained. I need to get the right systems, processes, and team members in place because you can't do it on your own. I don't care how brilliant of a leader you are, but that's where we get into, listen, I've had many people that I've worked with throughout my 40 years in various industries. Okay. And I could count on one hand, the ones that really got me and I got them, but that's because I wasn't being intentional about who to bring in and make sure it was a good fit. 
Now I, might, I take my time. And when you get those right people that are all in for the mission and aren't just ex not just exchanging time for money or navel gazing, punching the clock until they get to go home or retire, then you really get to spark your singularity and make a difference in the world. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's and it's so spot on and thinking about there's these five components, these five ingredients. And I love that you said, if you're, if you're feeling stuck, if you're feeling like you're not getting traction, take a look and see what you're missing. Where are you, you know, constrained, not quite there. You know, if it's the singularity, if it's the resources, where are you not at an optimal level that's preventing you from, from moving forward? Um, and that's that's so tangible. You know, people can take that information, read it, take a look at it, and do that self assessment, that introspection, um, or get some some help if they're if they're not able to do it themselves. They can get somebody else to say, "This is where it seems like you're stuck." Um, to really move forward, that's it's. I love that it's insightful, but also actionable. Uh, that's that's huge. Well, thanks, and that's what they tell people. You know, it's just it's life is poetry and plumbing. Uh, it can be very esoteric and beautiful, but if you don't roll up your sleeves and, and execute strategy, right? You know, and again, everything has this duality to it, and a lot of people just want to talk about success, you know, or but but yeah, that's that's great, but you have to, you know, it's not where the rubber meets the sky. Well, you got to make systems and processes and plans, and the book really helps you dial in. What are you feeling? OK, and then, you know, if you're feeling exhausted or frustrated or isolated or indecisive, depending on that number one feeling, then we dial into the root cause mm -hmm. so we can really unpack, um, you know, and, and we have the online course, which has a lot of great online tests and deeper dive questions where you can continue to mine and figure out, hey, how do I dial this in? Right. Yeah, that's that's great. And uh, yeah, I love that you again also keep thinking about uh, bringing up that that duality. Uh, you know, you need to have the systems and strategies to move forward, but if you don't have that focus and that mindset and if you don't have the vision piece and you don't have that feeling, that excitement, you know, you need both um to really make any progress. It's not just enough to have the mindset and the vision, like that's great. <laughs> but if you don't have the systems and the accountability and the how, you're not going to move forward. So that's a, a fantastic point that there's, as you said, with all of these things, there's that duality. And if you don't have both of those components in play or in balance, then you're you're going to struggle. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's yeah. the feeling and the knowing. You know, yeah. I feel, I know, I feel in my heart what I want to do, but I got to know, I have to have a reasonable expectation of success. And that means there's going to be things I need beyond me to help me get get that done. So and uh, y y but but you need them both because your feeling will help you hone when you dial in your singularity and you know it, then you know what conversations to have. OK, right. you know who to talk to, you know who your ideal client is. You get very focused, as you said, on, um, hey, this is the best and purest use of my time. Here's who's going to really get me and who I can become the most help to help help to not help to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how do you, you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> That's great. So in thinking about, um, and I think this relates probably a lot to um, the, the ask the singularity, but I still want to ask this question. So um, thinking about this idea of vision, you know, one of the quotes that you have on your website is that context is critical when communicating vision. So again, bringing it back to thinking about leadership and vision and effectively communicating that. Like, Talk to us more about that idea that context is critical. Share, share more about that. Oh, well, all this started was when I saw Darkest Hour, the movie on Churchill. And I think it was, um, I forget, I think it was Gary Oldman did Churchill. Anyways, it was all about Winston Churchill. And it, it came out, I think, about three years ago, and it was right before um, he was, everybody else had pretty much given up because Hitler was sweeping through. And um, I just remember uh, Gary Oldman, who was playing Winston Churchill, and, and uh, Ben Mendelsohn, who's another one of my favorite actors, uh, who was in the new Star Wars ones, of course. And so, big Star Wars fan. And so he comes in, and Churchill... Um, has been ostracized, kicked out, and only brought back into power because everybody else was uncourageous and wimpy. And they don't stand by him at all, 
Okay. And so he's trying to be courageous on his own, which no leader can do. You need at least one other person in your corner, just one. You don't need a thousand, just one, preferably two. Three is ideal. Three is ideal. Okay. But at least get one because then you know you're not losing your mind. Okay. And so um, I remember he, uh, Ben Mendelson comes in, who's King George, and says, because um, everybody was telling him, hey, you need to negotiate with Mussolini. And uh, knowing full well that this is not a negotiation. This is a hostile takeover and decimation of, of the UK, which I lived in, I'm okay, uh, for, for a couple of years when I was in the military. So uh, Ben Mendelssohn comes in and says, hey, you know what? Uh, and he did not like Winston Churchill. They thought he was a drunk. They thought he was nuts. You know, uh, Churchill's one of my favorites. Um, an unfiltered leader. And for mm -hmm. a crisis like that, you need an unfiltered leader. And so uh, King George said to him, hey, um, I'm not running into exile to Canada. And if Hitler's afraid of you, I'm going to throw my uh, backing support you. And in that moment, you see Gary Ullman kind of almost like the, the blood comes back into him and the life. OK, and I that's why I say context is when people talk about tough situations they're going through, you have to understand all the different things that led up to that, all the baggage that Churchill had, all the the, the failures from before him that, that he had to really carry and, and deal with. And he had to talk about, you know, all the political side, all the So when you're looking at leadership and people are like, well, I can't believe they did that. You don't know the context of anything going on. And that's why we vilify leaders. Do you even know what happened? Do you even know the whole context or the dialogue? All you hear is a snippet and what you're told. So that's why I tell people leadership is very nuanced. Um, you know, we'll see a five second review of something and automatically, but I know everything about it. It's like you don't know anything about it. And so you really have to not jump to conclusions and really just make sure uh, in leadership before you do make a knee-jerk reaction as a leader, um, engage in great sense-making strategies, which means you stay calm, cool, and collective. I mean, unless you're stopping nuclear weapons from coming over, uh, you know, into our land, um, take your time, do your research, let cooler heads prevail, and really observe the lay of the land and get a great, because when you examine what is really, and they are, they're called sense-making strategies. You actually um, get a lot more clarity and knowledge. K is a knowledge as a leader. So mm -hmm. context is really important. Don't let people just say to you, as a leader, you should do this. Well, well, it's like telling people in marriage counseling, you should do this. Wait, what? You don't know where they've been. You don't know what they've done. It's just like me taking my dog to the vets. And you know me, I have like a book. This is everywhere we've been. I send it to him ahead of time, review everything. So you know the context of what I've been through the last five weeks. And sure enough, I'll get there and they'll be like, now what's going on? And I'm like, yeah, the context, right. the context. I just spent a half an hour filling out forms online. So you can get the context. So when I show up to you, you don't just look at me and go, so what's going on? So as I tell people, um, don't just jump in to the stream really look at what's going on, understand the leadership context before you make any decisions. If anybody calls you and said, well, you need to talk to this person about that, or you need to call your sister about that. Wait, wait, wait. Because you also need to understand different people's motivations and why people may be saying different things to you because they may not always be uh, um, in your best interest. And most people are self-serving by nature. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Thinking about you know, I know the, the question was framed, uh, you know, context with communicating vision, but I love the, just the idea of taking the time to get and appreciate context across the board, both as, you know, as a leader, but also as a follower and just a general person. You know, I, um, I joke around that my my sixth grade teacher, uh, when I, one day we were in class, went up when he was talking about something and somebody must have made a comment about assuming and he said, and he stopped everything. He said, never assume. So I'm in sixth grade, never assume. Do you know why? And he walks up to the chalkboard, because yes, it was chalkboards back then, and <laughs> writes the word assume and strategically places two lines down through the word. And he says, because assuming makes, you know, and, um, and I think about that all the time. And I think that that's such a, a 
a key piece with the, the idea of context. Don't assume you understand. Don't assume you know. Take the time to get the context. Um, but as, if you're a leader and and one of your your employees or team members is having an issue, take the time to get the context. You know, yes, if there needs to be accountability or if there needs to be skill building, of course, but take the time to get the context. And if you are the follower, take that time to get the context. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't assume. Um, and even in our personal relationships, taking the time to get context is, is great advice. <laughs> context is tremendous. And yeah. Kelly, I'm so glad you said that. Uh, and, and again, context is vision because I'm bringing, I just brought a new person on my team this week. So in order for me to communicate the vision, I have to show them the context of when my father started the company and what I've been doing the last 12 years, because inevitably people will come in as great followers and say, well, have we tried this? And so I really want to make sure I understand and say yes. And here's what did or didn't work. Now, I'm not saying it's not a different time and we did everything right, but they want them to understand the context of uh, we're not at square one. We're at square a thousand and ninety nine and we're trying to get to twenty five hundred so they can kind of understand uh where we've been so we don't waste a lot of time and, and energy and resources that's why context is so important yeah and it, i think so often that gets lost you know as you were talking about sound bites and um you know just that some of the information that we consume again not only making sure we're, we're trying to weed out the, the negative toxic information and messaging, but also not getting so wrapped up in the soundbite society and really digging into that, that context. Like you were talking about doing our homework, doing our research, making informed decisions. Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's gold advice just in, in general for, for all of us. So thank you. That's for a good room for a book, Kelly, soundbite society. Oh, there we go. Maybe we can, we can co-author that. <laughs> We have our next project. Yeah. We'll put that in the list of the other 20 ahead of us. Not that we're not focused, folks. We're very focused. That's we are very focused. Yes. <laughs> so in the time, we have a few minutes left here, but um, in the time that we have uh, remaining, I want to ask, are there, what are some of your kind of key do's and don'ts or don'ts and do's if you want to end with the kind of the positive thing what are some some key things that um that you'd like to share and anything else that you would just like to to share i would say one of the biggest do's that goes along with leadership is maintain your physical health all right mm -hmm. no matter how brilliant we are we are still flesh and blood and so i would really say um make sure that you are getting um the right amount of sleep make sure that you are not engaging in destructive tendencies. Um, I haven't touched sugar in five years. I will never will. I just can't. It, it gives me brain fog. I just, I, I do other things. So, and it, when you dial in your health, everything else becomes so much more clear. And, and it's tough to get singularity when you're tired or you're sick or you're poisoning yourself. Um, so, you know, this whole thing about COVID and, and stay healthy, I'm like, well, people got to get healthy before they, you know, it's like people tell me when I was single, stay married. Okay, well, I kind of got to get married before I can stay married. So I tell people dialing in your health and there needs to be a way more robust discussion on that because um, your body is an unbelievable resilient thing and all you got to do is take care of it a little bit and it is, um, you know, it, it will respond in kind. The other do I would really say is you build that advocate network and you build it now. I am amazed at how many of my friends, even family members, go through a trauma or a crisis and they got no safety net. And I'm not talking just finances. I'm talking even people to come sit with them, take them in. It's unheard of. And, and I'm just like, or you'll see it. Well, so-and-so passed away and they have nothing. How do you have nothing? You need to go out there and make sure you have on your Rolodex. And I have different areas of my life. I have my financial mentors, my spiritual mentors, my personal mentors, my business. But I have this cadre. Well, when I need it, that's my army that comes to my support. And I would tell people, definitely, you build that because the time to prep for the crisis is not when the bullets start flying. It's well ahead of time. So those are the two. And, and when you have that robust network, you know, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Ecclesiastes 4. Uh, I, I had it at my wedding. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Mm. People break because they go it alone. And a lone sheep is a dead sheep. 
Okay. I talk about that in the book. Find those people and don't tell me you can't find them. That's being lazy. And then just don't sit there and throw up your hands and be histrionic and, and oh, the world, the world. Come on, man. We are so connected. Okay. Didn't mean to sound like Joe Biden there. Come on, man. Come on, everybody. Sorry. I had to do it. Um, you just really want to, you just, yeah. You just really want to make sure that you got that network. You got that network there because um, there are going to be times uh, when you're going to have to pass some stuff off to people. And um, they, they, your advocates want to be there to support you. But but um, just like your leader can't read your mind, your friends can't either. So let them know. And if they're not going to be there when you need them, you need to find ones that will be. So those are the two really things things that I would do. Yeah, no, that's so great. Those are great uh, pieces. And I, yeah, I'll just echo with the, the first one, especially for me, anybody who's talked to me recently, I'm constantly talking about nutrition and how I spent the last year figuring out I was having all kinds of nutritional issues, you know, what was, and it took me a year and it took, a, a, you know, again, that research and figuring it out. And I just feel so much better. And like, yeah, I was tired all the time. And you, know, you can't be productive. You can't be focused. You can't do those things when you're not feeling your best. So I, I love that you said that. Um, and yeah, it's so now it's so much, it's easier than ever to be connected and expand your network. There's no excuses. It does. You can live anywhere in the world and be connected with anybody anywhere in the world. And mm -hmm. so, um, I love, I love that, that piece of advice as well. That's great. Well, congratulations on finding that, but it takes work and people just want to pop a pill or not change their lifestyle. And I'm like, okay, you know, then it is, it is what it is. Right. You know, yeah. nothing's going to change until you change. So mm -hmm. That's right. Spark. And that's what Spark is about. What is that initial source of combustion when you finally go, I'm making the decision and I'm going to take action. And yeah. so we got to dial in. Where does that happen? Because once you're sparked, boy, then, then, then you're on your way. But until that happens, you just kind of, and I don't know. I mean, I reclaimed my health about three years ago, but there was a, a two decades before I was just like, I knew I needed to, I knew I needed to, but I didn't. Right. So what eventually hit me where I finally went, that's it. That's it done. Now it's time to act for action. Awesome. Well, Dr. Tracy Jones, thank you so, so much for spending time with us this afternoon. What a real pleasure and treat. I really enjoyed it. Um, where I'll make sure I put uh, in the comments the, the best place to find you, but I always like to give my guests the, the chance to say that where's the best place for people to connect with you? Well, sure. If for the bookstore and free online webinars and stuff like that. And if you sign up on our website, you get two weeks of free ebook downloads, which is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Build that, pay out that knowledge. That's tremendousleadership.com. And if you want to go over for my blogs, my leadership podcast, um, that's at Tracy C. Jones, T-R-A-C-E-Y-C Jones.com. So both of those things, one is kind of more the speaker course side and the other one is more the publishing. If you want to publish with us uh, too and uh, the book side. Nice. Wonderful. Well, I encourage everybody to, to check out Spark and all the other resources that that, uh, that Dr. Jones has available. Um, and again, just thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Waltman. I, it was an absolute honor. Thanks. And thanks for covering for me when the cord got unplugged. Absolutely. <laughs> we roll with it. <laughs> You're a pro, girl. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for watching um, and uh, for all your wonderful comments. And we'll see you next time.